following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The sacrament of baptism is the beginning for the initiate, for the aspirant to the light. In order to understand this sacrament, to understand the ancient ritual of baptism, it's important that you have listened and understood the previous two lectures called the Sacraments of the Gnostic Church, because it's there that you will be informed about and instructed in the nature of the Gnostic Church. And it's only from understanding what the Gnostic Church is and is not that you can then understand the sacraments of that church. But to remind you of the content of those lectures, let me just say that the Gnostic Church is not of this world. The supreme head or patriarch of that church is Abramento, who this humanity knows as Jesus the Christ or Yeshua. When he descended into a physical body some 2,000 years ago, he instituted a great form of help in order to aid the souls who are working on themselves in the physical world. And the help that he instituted and established through his great works and through his disciples, are precisely the sacraments. It's through the sacraments of the Gnostic Church that the consciousness can aspire towards the light, to incarnate that light, to manifest it. Baptism is an ancient ritual which belongs to the Gnostic Church. But it is a ritual that is far older than this current Aryan race. It is a ritual that has been present throughout all of the races that have inhabited this planet and those that inhabited the planets previous to this one. It has been known by many names. And in the many branches and faces of the Gnostic Church, baptism has always been present. When, at times in our development as a race, the Gnostic Church has delivered its teachings in the lands of India, or in the Middle East, or in Egypt, or in Tibet, the ritual of baptism has always been present. Although, of course, in those cultures and times and places, it was not known by that particular name. And this is why when we 
perform a comparative analysis of the various world traditions or world histories, we can always find rituals related to water, related to purification and initiation. Of course, baptism as a term and as a ritual is most identified in these times with Christianity and with its many varieties, Roman Catholic and Orthodox and Protestant. But all of those forms of baptism are derived from the same source, which is that source that was taught by Jesus when he was incarnated on this planet 2,000 years ago. But the baptism that he taught in his Gospels, that was performed by John, was a ritual that he also had acquired and learned in Egypt. A ritual that was performed in Egypt. And it's a ritual that has been performed since ancient times in India. This is why when you observe the practices and traditions of India, you will see many varieties of baptism. How yogis or disciples will be blessed with water by the um, priests of whatever temple. We see the rituals of baptism in Buddhism. We see it amongst the Maya. And amongst the Maya, it's particularly striking because young children are brought to the priest who exercises them of evil spirits and blesses them with blessed water when the children are ready to enter into puberty. And this has a very deep significance. We also find baptism in other forms, for example, in Roman culture, the sacred bath, or in the Jewish culture with the mikveh, the sacred bath, where the person will go to be purified by bathing themselves. And we find these sacred baths in every culture, in the Greeks, amongst the Turks, amongst all the ancient traditions. So the point that I'm getting at, obviously, is that baptism is a universal symbol. The physical practices of baptism, the physical rituals, are symbolic. And they're given, generally, to children. And children is also a symbolic term. In the Christian churches, babies are brought to be baptized. And this is symbolic of babies in initiation. Neophytes, disciples, people who are young in the teaching, who want to be initiated into that teaching and enter into that teaching. They receive the baptism of the waters. And in the Christian churches, the priest exercises evil spirits by performing prayers to reject the evil spirits that inhabit that child's body. And this is symbolic as well of the very purpose of baptism. And when that water is placed upon the head of the child, this is a symbol that we need to understand. <clears throat> the common theme amongst all forms of baptism has two aspects. One, it is a blessing with water. And two, it is a purification. The ritual of baptism symbolizes how through the waters, through the blessings of the waters, we can become pure. We can become clean. And this is why it's so prevalent in all of our world traditions. <clears throat> but in relation with the Gnostic Church, our purpose in this lecture is not to analyze and compare all of these various traditions. Instead, our purpose is to get at the root and to understand the practical significance of baptism and its, important as a, its importance as a sacrament, as something sacred. In Hebrew, water is symbolized by the, the Hebrew letter mem. 
Mem is the 13th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Mem, as a character or as a letter, can represent the number 13, but also can represent water as a force, as an element. This is very, very significant because the entire basis of the Jewish or Hebrew tradition and the entire basis of the Christian traditions rests upon an understanding of the Hebrew language because the authors, the deliverers, the patriarchs who gave these traditions were masters of Kabbalah. And of course, the Hebrew language is that symbolic script that encodes the teaching of Kabbalah. So to understand baptism, whether as the Jewish or Hebrew mikveh, or as the Christian baptism, we look back to the root, which is Hebrew. And we have to see what is the significance of water. You will know if you've studied any world religions that water is always in the beginning of any creation. In every world tradition, we find water as the beginning. So in Genesis, or Bereshit, we find that water is in the very first sentence of the Bible as the root, as the ground as the foundation from which everything emerges. The Bible says, Bereshit para Elohim et hashamayim. Excuse my Hebrew. But what it is basically saying is that in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens. The full sentence says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. But the word heavens is Shamayim, which is translated as heavens. But the literal meaning is superior waters. This is very important. Shamayim, superior waters. So when we say, when you read in the Bible, heaven, really you're reading superior waters. And so it's here in the very first phrase, God creates the superior waters and the earth. The earth symbolizes you and me. That which emerges, in other words, matter. So the earth is a symbol, the philosophical earth, or the body. And as you read a little further along, the next sentence says, The earth was without form and empty, with darkness on the face of the depths, but God's spirit moved on the water's surface. What's important to understand here is the nature of God's spirit. Hovering above these waters, which are yet to be formed, is the spirit, the ruach, which also means breath, the wind. This is the wind of God, or the breath of God, the ruach Elohim. And what's very interesting about this is when we compare this to Hinduism, and we look into the oldest, largest scripture that humanity knows, which is the Rig Veda, And in the Rig Veda, we discover that the basis of creation is a great river called Sarasvati. And these waters are the waters from which all creation emerges. And floating upon that river is Hamsa, the swan, who's a sacred bird, who's pure and white, and is the sacred bird of Sarasvati, And as you know, or as you may know, Sarasvati is the name of the Divine Mother. So these waters symbolize her womb. The life-giving waters of the womb of the Divine Mother, upon which floats the spirit, the bird, the breath, 
the hamsa. Also, Sarasvati, it's important to note, is the goddess of knowledge in Hinduism. And knowledge or intelligence is very significant in the Bible and in every tradition. Knowledge in Hebrew is da'at, and that's what we're studying. Intelligence is bina. And we know that the Divine Mother is the spouse of bina, is the feminine aspect of bina. And it's from bina that da'at emerges and creation occurs. And this is all within the womb of that Divine Mother. We study gnosis, which is knowledge. And that is the very body of the Divine Mother. Her essence is that. So then, in the Bible, it says a little bit later that God divides the heavens from the waters, divides the waters into two waters. He places a space or an expanse between the waters. In other words, in the sixth verse of Genesis, God divides the Shamayim from Mayim, the superior waters from the inferior waters. And puts between them a space or an expanse. So to repeat, so that this becomes clear, it's this that forms the basis of understanding baptism. Genesis states that God creates the heavens and the earth. The heavens in Hebrew are called shamayim, which means superior waters. And then God divides the waters. He places a space between the heavens and the deep between the Shamayim, the superior waters above, and the Mayim, which are the inferior waters. And between them is this expanse or space. And of course, upon that Shamayim is floating the sacred bird, the spirit, the Hamsa Swan, which floats upon the Shamayim, the Ruach Elohim in Hebrew the Spirit of God, the breath of God. Another uh, name that we could apply to Shamayim in this case would be prana, which is a Sanskrit word, which basically means life force, the force of life. And we say this because it's from this superior water of the Shamayim that the force of life will emerge. Here we have the womb of a divine mother, which is those superior waters of creation. And out of that comes creation itself. So this is, in a sense, we can say prana. In order to really understand the significance of this, we need to look a little deeper into these words, what they're made of, what they're constituted of. I told you a few moments ago that the Hebrew letter mem is a symbol for water. And if you look at shamayim and mayim, they are made of the letter mem. Mayim, or the inferior waters, is mem yod mem. This is also very significant. In other words, the Yod is between two Mayims. Between two waters. Mem signifies water. Yod is the tenth letter. It's the smallest letter. It is a dot, a drop, 
a speck. It's almost just an atom. The yod is the tenth letter, and it symbolizes man. This is why we have ten fingers and ten toes. We are that dot in the waters, placed there by our Father through the sexual act. That sperm that entered into the waters of our mother's womb. And there we were in the Mayim, the Yod, the seed, floating between the waters, between heaven and earth, in Eden. The womb is Eden. For us, at that time, we were in bliss. <clears throat> That's what Eden means. The term Eden literally means ecstasy, bliss. And when we were in the womb, we experienced that. Pure consciousness. In bliss. Enjoying life in the waters of our mother. But then we take birth and enter the physical world and everything changes. The Yod symbolizes the man. And that Yod, as the tenth letter, really is this tree of life, the ten spheres of the Kabbalah, which we need to perfect, we need to develop in ourselves. Shamayim is the same Mayim with one extra letter at the front of it. Shin. So Shamayim is spelled Shin, Mem, Yod, Mem. And Shin is also very significant. If you've listened to the course about the, the arcana of the Tarot and Kabbalah, you'll know why. Shin looks like a little trident. It has three points. And those three points are the three superior spheres on the tree of life. Christ. Keter, Hokma, and Bina in one. Shin represents the Trinity. And this is how you can see. Shamayim are those superior waters which exist above where Christ is. The three letters of Shin, the three arms of Shin in those superior waters. The tree of life itself maps all of this. When we look at the tree from the macrocosmic point of view as a map of the universe, we can see those superior waters above in Da'at, which is just below the superior trinity. And it's in Da'at, those superior waters, where those three forces embodied in Shin create. From there unfolds all of the rest of the tree. And this is that space that exists between the superior and inferior waters, where God divides Shamayim from Mayim. The Mayim are below in Yasod. Yasod is the ninth sphere on the tree of life, and it is the inferior waters, the lower waters, or Eden. Yasod, the ninth sphere. The word Yasod means foundation because it's the foundation of life. When we look at the tree of life, the Kabbalah, from the microcosmic point of view, then we would place this symbol of ten spheres superimposed over the human body. And in that case, we can see that the superior waters, Shamayim, are related with the head, with the brain. And you know that around your brain, there are waters very important waters that are very similar in constitution to the waters of the womb and the waters of the sex. The inferior waters, Yasod, rest directly over the sexual organs. So you see the relationship? Mayim and Shamayim. Yasod is the foundation of life. 
It's through sex that all life exists. Through Yasad, the ninth sphere, through the sexual organs. And it's here that our own Yod, the seed, was placed in the womb of our physical mother and our physical body emerged through the foundation of life, Yasad, sex. What's interesting to know is that in the Bible, man was placed in Eden, in Yasad. And Yasad, of course, like everything, has multiple levels of meaning. Yasad is Eden, which is related with sex, but it's also the fourth dimension, which is Eden. And this is where Adam and Eve were originally placed. But in us, we need to look at it from our point of view to understand baptism. Yasad is where the rivers of life emerge. And when you look into the Bible, you see that from the garden come the rivers, and it was parted into four heads, into four ways. This has very deep significance. But the point of it is, the waters of life, the river of life, emerges from Yasad. And when our physical parents conceived our physical bodies, the waters of Eden flowed from Yasad, the sexual organs, out of Malkut, the physical body. You see that? The waters of Yasad flowed out and a physical creation occurred. Oh. <laughs> yeah, this is also hidden in the meaning Mayim. When you see the two Mems are the two waters of our parents and the Yod is between them. There's a transfer that occurs in Mayim. And this is related with birth in any level. What's important for us to understand is that this is the common way. But baptism refers to another way. The word Shamayim can be read with another meaning. If there's a space between the Shin and Mayim, then you would read it Samayim, which means to carry water. This is very significant. To carry water. This is baptism. What occurs in baptism but the elevation of the waters from below to above. In the Christian tradition, the priest scoops the water, often from a conch shell or a basin, from the waters below and scoops them up to the head of the child and pours the waters on the crown, which is where that chakra is related to the pineal gland, which, of course, as we said, is related to Shamayim, the superior waters. So that ritual of baptism in the Christian tradition symbolizes how we perform Shamayim to carry the waters of Mayim to heaven. Very deep symbolic significance. How is this done and why? Here's where it gets even more interesting. The secret is in Yasad. Because in those waters of Yasad lie latent the powers of Shin. You remember that in the beginning God created Shamayim, the heavens. But you have to analyze also Shamayim a little more deeply. That word is translated as heavens, but literally means superior waters. But why are they superior? Why is Shamayim superior to Mayim? Because it has Shin. Shin is the Hebrew character for fire. The Shamayim, the heavens, the superior waters, are superior because within them, at the head of them, 
leading those waters, commanding those waters, is fire, shin, Christ. This is why those waters are superior. God divides the waters between inferior and superior. And in the inferior waters, we have the yod, the seed. And what do you find at the top of the three arms of the shin, but three yods? This is also very deep significance. By performing the Shah Mayim, the carrying of the water, the initiate who receives the sacrament of baptism learns how to take the fire of sex and elevate it to transform it. Fire, obviously, is the root of sex. We know that sex happens in the sexual waters of the man and the woman, the two mems of the mayim. And when that sexual contact is stirring, the waters boil because within the water is fire. But it's raw fire, untransformed, unmanaged, without conscious control. And then that water can burn. That water can create physically, and it can create in the spirit. And this is what Jesus taught in the Bible. Within those sexual organs, we have heat, fire. And this is where we find the basis of a very famous tradition in Asia called the yoga of psychic heat, Dumo, which is one of the six yogas of Naropa and is the basis of the Kagyu school of Tibetan Buddhism, one of their main traditions. The basis of that technique of Dumo yoga or psychic heat is that the yogi must retain the sexual energy, must hold that fire and transform it in the body. And if they live by that and learn the technique called pranayama, which means to yoke the wind, to yoke the forces of shamayim, the prana, they learn how to generate and manage and create heat in the body. And this is where we get these famous stories about yogis up in the Himalayan mountains in the freezing cold wearing nothing and not cold. And in fact, they do their breathing exercises and they melt the snow around them. This is Dumo Yoga. And it's all based on the fire in the waters of the sexual energy. Interestingly, the word Dumo means she who terrifies the ego. Because that water is the water of the Divine Mother. And that fire in that water is Durga, Sarasvati, the Divine Mother who conquers the ego. When we learn how to harness that fire, what we need to learn is how to control Shin, fire. We control it by willpower. And this is how we learn to unite our own Shin with our own mayim and create sha mayim within. This is how we create the superior waters. This is the ritual of baptism. Symbolizes that. And of course, the book of Genesis is an exposition of that. The book of Genesis generate gender and gender. Genesis is creation. How to create the power of creation is in sex, is in fire. And so Genesis, with its seven days of creation, outlines seven steps to create man. But man in this term does not mean male. It means Adam, the root, the man, the soul, the perfected man who abides in Eden. To be a perfect man is to have a perfect mind, to be a diamond soul, to be a Buddha. And Genesis explains that. 
through the days of Genesis. We study that. Baptism is the initiation into that process. The physical rituals of baptism symbolize that. But they only symbolize a work that we have to perform inside of ourselves, sexually and psychologically. It's not necessary for you to pass through a physical initiation of baptism. It's not required. It's symbolic. What is required to enter heaven, Shamayim, is to control the fire, the shah, the shin, in your own mayim. And that's why that ritual of baptism was always given. In the Gospels, we have the description of the ritual of baptism, which I'll read to you so we can go deeper into understanding what this ritual means. In the, in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, it says this, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Shamayim. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. The way of the Lord here is Christ. Shin. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then he went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region about Jordan, and were baptized of, of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Jordan is a river. So John, the baptizer, stands in the river and baptizes all those who would repent of their sins and prepare themselves for the coming of Christ in themselves. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, now, the Pharisees and Sadducees represent the intellectuals who don't do anything but theorize and the believers who don't do anything but believe. He says to them, O oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruit, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The tree is the tree of life. Our own tree of life. It's necessary for us to bring forth good fruit. Otherwise the fire will consume us. The fire of sex. What is that fruit? Everyone knows in the Bible that God says, be fruitful. And how do you grow fruit but from a seed? And what is that seed but the yod, the sexual organ? The seed that we have to grow the fruit from is the yod in the mayim, which is in yasod. And that fruit develops when we redirect the river of life that flows from Eden. And instead of that river flowing outwards into the desert, it flows upwards into the tree itself and nourishes the tree, and the tree gives forth all the fruit. And the Bible in the book of Revelation says there are 12 manners of fruit. And those fruit are related to our 12 senses. Five physical and seven non-physical. Those fruits are how we interact with all the other dimensions of life. And Adam and Eve in the Bible were able to eat of that fruit and they could see God and talk with God and walk with God because they had that fruit in their hands, the fruit of the tree of life. They had not abused of the fruit of knowledge, the fruit of sex. So he continues, Indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, 
whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So here, of course, John is talking about Christ, who is, of course, shin, fire, that shin which will come as a result of baptism that can be managed and harnessed through the practice of Shah Ma'im to carry the waters above. Christ is a fire that can create or destroy. That fire is symbolized in India as Shiva. And if you look at the images of Shiva, he always has a fountain emerging from his crown of his head, from the pineal gland, which symbolizes the transmuted sexual waters which burst forth from the waters of his brain and his pineal gland at the top of the spine. That fire, that fiery water of Shamayim is what can purify our sins, can save us. It is superior to the waters of the river Jordan, which is what John baptizes his students with. And he continues, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And what he's describing here is the process by which that fire of Christ purifies. It descends and purifies to cleanse the temple of the Lord. This is why it's so important for us to understand the nature of shin in ourselves. Shin is that sexual fire. When we misuse that sexual fire, we become consumed by it. In many ways, sometimes we become addicted to sex, to the sensations of sex, which causes us to seek more intensity. And thus people enter into more degenerated sexual practices until eventually they destroy themselves through too much fornication, through disease, through depleting themselves of all energy. We know well, of course, that power is in the sexual energy, force. This is why warriors and fighters for ages were always told, before a battle, do not lay with your wife. Because they knew that the warrior who expelled his seed would be weak on the battlefield. And this is why boxers and fighters in these times also observe abstinence before they have a big match. Because they know that that energy gives them strength. And what's interesting is if you look into the root of the words, virile and virtuous, they come from the same root. Vir in Sanskrit which is related to virya, which means semen, sexual energy. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for it is becometh us to fulfill all righteousness virtue. Then he suffered him and baptized him. To understand this properly, we have to refer to the tree of life. If you have studied the course about the path of the bodhisattva, the meaning here will be perfectly clear to you. John is actually, the actual name of John is Jahanan. It's not John. John is an English or Latin name. His real name is Jahanan. Ja has three letters, and it is, of course, the supernal triangle, the logos. Hanan means grace. The grace of Christ is the bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is another Sanskrit word. It has very deep, very deep meanings. On the surface, it means the wisdom of the awakening mind. Bodhi is wisdom. Chitta is mind. But bodhicitta in tantra 
it is a blind. It is a veil. It is a mask to hide something deeper. If you've studied Buddhism, you know that bodhicitta in Mahayana Buddhism and Tantrayana, Mantrayana, is the aspiration to be a servant of others. And this is why they pray, as long as space endures, may I continue to be in order to aid others. It's a pure act of selfless service. Bodhicitta is love, conscious love. That's the surface level translation. But in Tantra, bodhicitta means sexual energy. And this is why John, Jahanan, is in the river Jordan in Yasod. Jahanan represents the bodhicitta, that pure, perfect, compassionate force of Christ which stands in the waters of life in order to baptize the initiates who would become one with Christ. And bodhicitta is a psychic energy, a psychological force, who expresses itself through the bodies of the soul, the seven bodies. And that's why Jahanan can be disarranged as Eeyoams, the seven vowels. Those seven vowels symbolize the seven primary chakras, the seven bodies, the seven notes. So bodhicitta is a very deep symbol. John, in this case, represents the initiate, the man, the complete man. And that's why he says he is not worthy to even hold the shoes of Christ, Jesus. Because Jesus comes from above. Jesus, in the path of the Bodhisattva, can descend and incarnate in the Bodhicitta, in the man who is prepared. But in, before that, he cannot. Because that energy is too intense. Only the bodhicitta, which is developed and is prepared to receive that incredible energy, can receive Christ and incarnate Christ and express Christ. Baptism symbolizes that. And that symbolism is based upon stage one to elaborate the lower mayim, to create from that mayim of Yasod the man the solar man, the vehicle of Christ, Heracles, the Bodhisattva. And once that man is created, then Christ can descend into the river Jordan and be incarnated inside the soul. And this is the baptism. Baptism by water and by fire. This is all synthesized in this very brief description but it has levels and levels and levels and levels of meaning. Baptism is not one single thing. We're speaking in synthesis. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens, Shamaim, were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And who is the dove but Hamsa? that swan of purity, the swan, the bird of the divine spirit, the divine mother, Sarasvati, the Kalahamsa swan, as it's also called, or the swan of time. Hamsa means swan, and Kala means time. Now some of you may know the term Kala, from a tradition called Kala Chakra. Chakra means wheel. So Kala Chakra means the wheel of time. Kala Chakra is a tantra, a scripture, which was given by the Buddha and has been preserved in Tibet for a long time. In recent years, the 14th Dalai Lama has been conducting many rituals to initiate people into the Kala Chakra Tantra. 
And this becomes very interesting for us to know about. Because in the process of being initiated into Kala Chakra, the ritual lasts 13 days. Remember the letter Mem? Is the 13th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Within those 13 days, the disciple who's being initiated passes through seven initiations. Remember the name John, Jahanan, is disranged into seven vowels related to seven chakras. And in those seven initiations, the disciples receive a blessing of water. The Lama, the priest, sprinkles water on the disciples and dabs water on their chakras to prepare them for the practice of Kala Chakra. It becomes more interesting when you understand that the main image of Kala Chakra is a great painting of the father and mother in sexual union. This is called Kala Chakra, the wheel of time. It shows the father and mother. Father is called Yab in Sanskrit. Mother is called Yum. And their union is Kala Chakra, the wheel of time, from which creation emerges. And those disciples of Kala Chakra are required to take a series of vows. The main vow, to never release the sexual energy. The practitioner of Kala Chakra is told their entire success in realizing and practicing the ritual and, and secret practices of Kala Chakra depends upon never emitting sexual energy from the body, never having an orgasm. This is the basis. And if they have that energy, it's called a fault, and a um, breaking of the vow. And it stops their progress. And so you can see in Kala Chakra what we teach here. The Kala Chakra is a form of baptism. But let's return to our story. When that uh, dove, the Kalahamsa swan, came down and lit upon Jesus, illuminated him on the pineal gland, came down upon his head, and that's the power of Shin, the spirit, the Ruach, And lo, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Of course, the Son we know is Christ. So this story is deeply symbolic. What we see in the story in synthesis is how, by performing the Shamayim, the carrying of water, we enter into Shamayim heaven. John symbolizes the soul, the initiate himself, who by his own effort scoops the waters of the river of life, the sexual water, and brings it up to his head through transmutation and baptizes himself. And this is how Christ emerges and within us. This practice is done in a number of ways. A single person can transmute their sexual energy. But they cannot create the man. A single person can be baptized and can enter into the mysteries related to baptism. And when they receive that ritual from whatever tradition, what they're, being, what they're receiving and agreeing to is a pact with the Gnostic Church, with Christ. It is a pact of sexual magic or priesthood. As you remember, magic comes from mag, which is priest. That pact is a promise that that initiate will fulfill the requirements of sexual magic, 
which are to transform the fires of sexuality into shamayim, the fiery waters of heaven. To do that requires that we are married. Only a man and a woman united can fully activate and develop and control and transform the waters of sex. A single person has only one polarity, either male or female. It's in the connection of the two, the two mems of Mayim, where then that Yod can be transformed. This is very significant. As I told you, the Yod represents the man. So if we put a Yod, we see the man, or in other words, Adam. And in order for Adam, or the man, to elaborate the Shah Ma'im, the Shin, he needs a woman. And in Hebrew, we would write Heve. He, thou, he. So here we see Adam and Eve, man and woman. Of course, these four letters are Jod, He, Vau, He, the four letter name of God. So, in order for these two, man and woman, to enter Shamayim, they need Christ. No one comes to the Father but through the Son. Fire is the way. And Christ says as much, that he's coming to, what is the quote? I am come to send fire on the earth, he says in the book of Luke. Christ is come to send fire on the earth, the body. He's the one who provides that fire of sex. It comes from Christ. Therefore, when the man and the female, the woman, unite and harness the power of the shin, and that shin comes between the yod and the heve, then you have a new word. Yod, shin, he, vav, he. That spells Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ. Do you get that? When you put Shin, Christ, in between the man and the woman, the Yab and the Yom, you spell the word Savior in Hebrew. Yeshua. Through sexual union, through sexual cooperation, through the mastery of sexual fire, the Savior is born. Jesus stated that in order to enter into heaven, we have to be born again of water and spirit. We have to be born of mayim and shin, fire. When we take that pact of baptism seriously and we unite the man and the woman in the sexual act to transform the shin, that energy, the fire in the water, is transformed and is brought up the spine. And this is how the serpent is raised upon the staff, how the Son of Man is raised up in the wilderness. Christ is raised up from the lower waters to the superior waters. And this is called Kundalini, the Pentecostal fire that, that alit upon the heads of the apostles in the book of Acts. That Pentecostal fire is Shin, the fire of Christ. When that fire raises the spinal column and fills the brain in our own personal Shamayim, the pineal gland is saturated with a very high voltage energy, which is that fire from the sex. 
Here we see the relationship between, in the microcosm in our body, the mayim of yasod and the shamayim of the waters around the brain. Even scientists know that the waters that surround the brain are chemically similar to the waters of sex. That energy is transferred through vital channels up the spinal column and saturate the brain with what in Hinduism is called ohas, O-J-A-S, which are fire. And ohas is transformed sexual energy. They say in India that a man who has a lot of ohas in his brain is extremely powerful, magnetic, successful, intelligent, bright, attractive to others, is a prophet. And this is symbolized by, in the baptism story, Jesus rises from the waters, the dove of the Shamayim lights on his head, and Jesus ascends into the Shamayim. Jesus symbolizing that transformed energy. In the Gospels, it also says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus, Yeshua, the Savior, stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Living water is mayim hayim. And we find references to living water throughout the Bible, both the Christian traditions and the Hebrew traditions. And the superficial definition of living water is fresh water. But this is not the real meaning. And it's easy to arrive at the real meaning. Where else can you find waters of life? From what waters do, does life emerge? The waters in the womb the waters of the semen. When those waters are crossed, life emerges. And Jesus says, you must be born again of the water and the spirit. That which is flesh is born of flesh. And that which is spirit is born of spirit. There are two forms of birth, physical and spiritual. Through harnessing the living water, we're harnessing the Christ within the Mayim. This is why it says in the book of Proverbs, drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountain be blessed and have the joy of the wife of thy youth. In other words, conserve your sexual energy and the waters of your own fountain will revitalize your own tree of life. And we know this is the interpretation because in the book of Leviticus, Vayikra, written by Moses, he wrote this, When a man discharges semen, he must immerse his entire body in a mikvah, a ritual bath, and then remain unclean until evening. It's very clear. The release of sexual energy produces uncleanliness, filthiness. This is called fornication. Fornication, of course, has been mistranslated for hundreds of years. But when you know the esoteric doctrine, you know fornication refers to the orgasm. This is why when we study also in Buddhism, the great consort of Padmasambhava, or Guru Rinpoche, was named Yeshe Sogyo. She was a princess in Tibet who practiced karma mudra with him, which means action seal. And this is the sacred practice of transmutation between man and woman. In one of her teachings, she said, if the seed essence is lost, in actuality, the karma of slaying a Buddha is incurred. At all costs, gain self-control. So she says, 
So it is. The discharge of the sexual energy produces pain, produces suffering, produces a loss of vitality or vital energy. It is how we slay our own inner Buddha, how our own tree is deprived of fruit and will be cut down. We need to be healed because all of us are children of fornication. All of us, without exception. And we need to be healed of our past mistakes and enter into the mysteries. And this is why we need baptism. Through baptism in ourselves, sexually and psychologically, we commit to change. It is a pact, a vow, to learn to respect the force of Christ, the intelligence of God, which is within our own waters, to respect that and follow the laws of God, the laws that are reflected in every ancient tradition but obscured and lost by the selfishness of men. Regarding this healing, we find another brief scripture in the book of John. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Beth Hezda, having five porches. Now, I'm going to point out to you that Beth Hezda means the house of, of the waterfall. In these porches lay a great multitude of impotent folk. Impotent, weak, powerless. Blind, halted, withered. Waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and stirred the water. And whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatever dis-ease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus, Yeshua, saw him lying there, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. In other words, here is a man who is impotent. And we know now we use the word impotent to be related to sexual weakness, to have no power sexually. And nowadays, this is becoming more and more and more common in women and men. But nobody dares to ask why. And it's because they have been perpetually, addictively, wasting their sexual energy day after day. Depleting their own tree so that their own tree of life, their own soul, their own body is withering, is dying, is becoming cancerous, is becoming sick. And then the fire will come and clean it so they can try again later, but with pain. So this impotent man lies by the side of the pool, the house of the waterfall, meaning that he knows something about baptism. He knows that the waters can cure him, but he has no man to put him in the water. In other words, he has no John the Baptist. He does not have a baptizer. He does not have bodhicitta. He has not created the soul. So what does Jesus say? Yeshua the Savior saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. meaning is explicitly clear. Raise the power of Shin in your own waters and take up your bed of matrimony, your bed of Tantra, 
your bed of transmutation between man and wife. And with that, walk on the path. And by that way, you will create the man. And immediately by Christ, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. You know, in the Bible, in Genesis, Sabbath is the day that God rests. Why? Because he created the man. In the Hebrew tradition, the baptism is hidden in the practice of the mikveh. Mikveh is a ritual bath. And the Jews and and people who subscribe to that tradition will bathe themselves regularly throughout their lives to go to sacred pools and bathe themselves. And this story reflects some of that. Of course, in most cases, the practitioners of that tradition are unaware of the esoteric meaning that by bathing ourselves in the sexual waters, we can be cleansed of impurity. But they have a prayer that they repeat when they go to the bath. And the translation of the prayer is, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and the conquest of the land become instantaneous. And this is, of course, symbolic. Arise, O Lord. Of course, we need the Lord, Christ, the shin in our sex to rise up the spinal column from the sexual energy, the sexual organs, up the spine to the pineal gland. And in doing that, to scatter the enemies of the Lord, which is our own mind, the ego, our own lust, our pride, our anger, our envy, our sins of adultery and fornication. And the conquest of the land become instantaneous. The land is the earth. The land is us. We need the Lord to conquer our land, to be the commander-in-chief of our house, to be the priest of our temple. That's what this prayer is saying. And this reveals the relationship between baptism and the forgiveness of sins. There are many Christians who mistakenly believe that as soon as they're baptized, their sins are forgiven and they're done. They receive the baptism and now they're going to go to heaven. Simple as that. Nowhere in the Gospels does it say this. This is an unfortunate interpretation. The Gospels state otherwise, that only the perfect enter heaven. No idolater, no adulterer, no fornicator, no thief, no murderer. And all of us are that. All of us are fornicators and adulterers and thieves and murderers because we know that the Christ said, even if you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery with her in your heart, which means you cannot enter heaven. You cannot enter Shamayim. So all those crimes, as long as we're committing them in the mind, as long as the potential for that crime is there, we are imperfect and we have dis-ease a sickness of the psyche. To be forgiven of those sicknesses, to earn the right to enter heaven, we have to become meek and poor. To not be rich psychologically. But to have none of those possessions in the mind. And this is the great secret of the sexual energy. This same energy, this fire, that we use to create a physical birth, also creates the sexual birth, the spiritual birth inside. But that same energy is the creator and destroyer. Shiva is the creator and destroyer of God, the Holy Spirit. That fire of the Holy Spirit can conquer the Egyptians. Right? The Egyptians are our own egos. All of our sins, all of our mistakes. When we harness that fire, we learn to utilize it to eliminate the ego. And this is why in the book of Leviticus it says, when, we, when any man has an emission of semen, he should wash himself in the mikveh, in the sacred bath of transmutation, and be unclean until evening. Evening is a symbol of death. This is when the sun goes down and darkness comes, 
In other words, we will be unclean until the ego is dead. It doesn't say that the mikveh, the bath, the baptism, will cleanse you of your sins. It says the evening will. And evening is death. It's only through the death of the ego that cleanliness comes. The mikveh, the baptism, helps because it's where we harness that force in order to direct it against the ego. The, this death has three essential phases. The first one is to transmute the energy, to actually in, endeavor ourselves in our own baptism, to drink of those waters inside and recycle them, restore them, regenerate ourselves. So transmutation is the first step. The second step is meditation, self-reflection, self-inquiry. And this is the process whereby we get to know our enemy. We need to study our enemy, who is our own mind. Once we know that enemy, and we start to see the depths of that enemy, not just the physical, superficial characteristics, but the klipoth, our own subconscious, unconscious, and infraconscious mind, which are not visible from the physical world. Then we can begin to pray for the elimination of those enemies. But they cannot be eliminated if we haven't understood them. In other words, if we still hold within ourselves the potential to c- commit a crime, the f- that sin cannot be forgiven because the cause of the sin still is there. We need to fully understand the crime and fully understand why we never need repeat it. When that understanding is complete, then that crime can be removed, that source. What's interesting is that the transmutation of that practice, or the transmutation of that energy, is a practice that has multiple forms. I mentioned one, which is the union of husband and wife, which is called Tantra, Maituna, Urdhvareta, Karma uh, Mudra, right? These different names. Those for couples. And for single people, there's a variety of practices called Pranayama, which is Sanskrit. And one of the main ones we teach in Gnosis is called Hamsa, which is the name of that sacred bird, the Ruach Elohim that floats upon the waters of Shamayim. When we harness that energy, we begin to empower our own inner being to bring fruit to our tree. When we are delivering the power of the Shin to our God and empowering this tree and becoming fruitful inside, then our own inner being can utilize that energy to destroy our ego. And this is how Christ becomes our Savior. No one comes to the Father but through me, means. No one comes to the Father but through shin, through fire, through Christ, through sexual energy. And that energy destroys the ego and liberates us from suffering. This is why in the Rig Veda, we see the story of Indra, the God. Indra has in his hand the Vajra, which means thunderbolt. But that thunderbolt is a phallus. It is the sexual organ. And that Vajra is the main symbol of Vajrayana, which is Tantra in Tibet. The thunderbolt, the sexual energy. That is the Yod. This is Indra's main tool, the Yod, the sexual force. Now, in the Rig Veda, which is this old scripture I've been telling you about, the demon Vritra has stolen all the waters from the earth. Did you know that? In other words, the ego has stolen our sexual water. The demon, the Asura, Vritra. So Indra, the god who's related with this superior triangle above, kills the demon Vritra using the Vajra. 
And when he does so, all of the waters are returned to the earth and life flourishes again. Spiritual life. This is the meaning of that story. It's extremely deep. Okay? Um, this, what this implies for us is that we have to work. This is not something that can be achieved overnight. It requires a great deal of effort. We're not saved just because we believe in something. We have to transform ourselves. This is why baptism, which is related with Yasod, is the foundation of the temple. Yasod means foundation. Baptism is the foundation of the Gnostic Church. In order to enter into the Gnostic Church, you must be baptized. This does not mean that you have to pass through a physical ritual. It means you have to be baptized inside. In other words, you must become chaste, enter into the path of chastity, and from that, you knock on the door of initiation and can enter the Gnostic Church. On that note, we will end the lecture with a short scripture that I'll read to you from the Rig Veda. Uh, But to understand this, let me explain one last point. In the Rig Veda, Shin is called Agni, which means fire. So this short scripture from the Rig Veda is called the waters of life. And this is a prayer. Waters, you are the ones who bring us the life force. Help us to find nourishment so that we may look upon great joy. Let us share in the most delicious sap that you have as if you were loving mothers. Let us go straight to the house of the one for whom you, you, your waters give us life and give us birth. For our well-being, let the goddesses be an aid to us, the waters be for us to drink. Let them cause well-being and health to flow over us. Mistresses of all the things that are chosen, rulers over all peoples, the waters are the ones I beg for a cure. Soma has told me that within the waters are all cures and Agni, who is salutary to all. Waters, yield your cure as an armor for my body so that I may see the sun, Christ, for a long time. Waters, carry far away all of this that has gone bad in me, either what I have done in malicious deceit or whatever lie I have sworn to. I have sought the waters today. We have joined with their sap. O Agni, fire, full of moisture, come and flood me with splendor. Any questions? Well, we say that they can only know what their physical senses tell them, which is very limited. Not, they're not members of the Gnostic Church. They have not awakened their consciousness. They have not entered into initiation. They know nothing of the qualities of the Spirit. They are the Pharisees and Sadducees of the Bible who believe, who theorize, but do not know. And there are many theories. And we're free to believe what we like and use whatever data or reasoning we want to justify our behaviors. But if we want to enter heaven, Shamayim, we have to rely on those who have been there, who know that realm. And those are the great prophets, the avatars. They all universally teach, do not orgasm. Do not. That is the basis of the teaching, the basis of the tradition. And many people come up with millions of excuses why they can, why they should, why it's healthy. And that's fine. They can do that. They just have to bear the consequences of it. Sad. Yes? What would you say to uh, a 
like an elevated yogi like Yogananda that comes and delivers the teachings to the West and never took a wife. You know, I mean, somebody in the West looks at his life and sees that you know he never took a wife, and they get this impression that you know stay single. Obviously, I mean. well. To understand the point of view of the variety of yogis who have taught yoga, we have to keep in mind that there are many levels of the teaching. Tibetan Buddhism itself is arranged in many, many levels, and so is Hinduism. Yogananda was a practitioner of Kriya Yoga, but he refused the higher teachings. He rejected them. His instructor, who was married, wanted to initiate Yogananda into the higher teachings and asked him, told him, it's time for you to get a wife. Yogananda stepped away. He said, no, he didn't want it. And this is his right. We all have the right to choose how we want to approach the path. But in that, we have to keep in mind, we will only get what we ask for, what we perform. We only get the consequences of our actions. If we want to enter into the highest levels, we have to utilize the highest practices. It's quite simple. Naturally, we need to be prepared for that. In past ages, humanity was not prepared for these teachings, and so they were kept secret, only given to those who were prepared. And this is why throughout centuries and centuries, all the students of every tradition, East and West, were required first to awaken their consciousness, to awaken, to have conscious capacities beyond the physical senses. And once they had developed that, then they could understand this doctrine. Now the end of the age has come. Time is short. And as an act of compassion, the Gnostic Church has authorized the public release of this knowledge so that those who will take advantage can. And those who will not have that free will. They're free to choose. Yes? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, the question is about those who practice the, the retention of sexual energy, but more as a curiosity or as an experiment. God is not mechanical. God is an intelligence. The Christ is a great intelligence. The Divine Mother is a great intelligence. And Kundalini, or Kandali, that sacred fire that awakens from the practices of Tantra is the very intelligence of God. It is Shin. It is the fire of Christ, which is pure wisdom. And that fire cannot awaken without specifically satisfying the requirements of it. It's impossible. And there are a lot of people who write books and teach classes and charge money and travel around and teach this and that about Tantra and transmutation, etc., etc. And they can do all the practice of Tantra they want. They can transmute their sexual energy. They can read as many books as they want and get initiated into any tradition. But if they do not satisfy the requirements of the heart, they will never awaken it. The Kundalini is a force of morality, of purity of sanctity, which means it awakens in relation to our destruction of our own ego, to our ability to consciously become in harmony with the laws of Christ. And by Christ, I mean that force, not Christian, not a Christian force, but Christ, Chinrezi, Avalokiteshvara, Ketsal Kual, Kukul Khan. Christ has many names. Kuan Yin, Heracles, Jupiter. These are all names of Christ. Krishna. We can be of any tradition and we can practice this technique within any religion. 
But unless we satisfy the moral requirements, the, that fire cannot awaken. And so there are people who do this. They play games. They sleep with different partners. They practice transmutation, but they are still thieves and murderers and adulterers and liars. And so in them, there will be no redemption. Rasputin is a great example of that. Rasputin was a monk in Russia who learned the practices of transmutation and went to Russia and was teaching them and practicing this with many women. And he awakened a lot of power, but as a demon. This is precisely the great danger of this technique and why it was kept secret. Why it was required that people should awaken their consciousness first in order to see the realities of the ego and the realities of karma. Karma is real. It's cause and effect. Simple. When I say we have to abide by the law, it's that. Cause and effect. This technique is extremely powerful, but has to be used in harmony with the law of cause and effect. In other words, if we start transforming this energy, but we do not direct it to destroy the ego, there is a creation that occurs, there is a birth that occurs, but it is the birth of a demon, a devil. Yes. So when presenting this, it's really as it is now, it's really also perhaps, that's why it was kept secret for so long, because some people won't want to use it in that right way. It's true. Some people are, will just be curious on this one side of it. This is why in the book, The Major Mysteries, Samael Ambior stated very clearly, stay back curious people. Because from Gnosis, angels and demons are born. One or the other. No exception. No vagueness. Nothing in the middle. There's no middle between them. You choose one or the other. If you use these practices, if you use this wisdom, you will awaken. But in accordance with your deeds. In accordance with your works. Not your intentions. And this is a, a tremendous thing that people overlook. We all have this personality that believes that when we relate ourselves to the right teaching or teacher, we'll be saved. That everything will be okay. Because I found the real thing. Now I'm going to be okay. I'm sorry, but this is not true. We'll be okay in accordance with our works. Simple as that. And Samael gave some examples of this, in particular, in The Mystery of the Golden Blossom. There's a book called Treason, which we talk about from time to time. And in this book, he describes a person that he calls Brutus, in order to not name a person in particular that he knew. And he says, Brutus thought that the Divine Mother Kundalini was mechanical. And this man practiced sexual magic with his wife and thought simply because of that he would awaken as a prophet or an angel in the internal worlds as a white master. He did awaken. And he did awaken as a master, but in evil. And he didn't know it. He thought he was doing good. He continued to think he was doing good until the day he died. And he had awakened consciousness and he had powers and he had many followers who still fight tooth and nail to protect his legacy and his teachings. And it's very sad. Yes? I keep hearing, you know, um, that a true marriage is a pact, you know, to practice sexual magic. And yeah. So, of course, the death of the ego. Uh, and I've been told for many years you still have to go with the physical customs if you're in a marriage certificate. We're going to get in depth in the matrimony, the sacrament of matrimony, when that lecture comes. Um, but just in synthesis, the marriage occurs as soon as sexual union occurs. The Bible says they will be one flesh, and that is a marriage. Simple as that. But the rest of it we'll deal with in the later lecture. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. 
people were born with spark, the ability to awaken, and some were not. Mm-hmm. Um, how does this teaching respond to that question? It's true. That spark that gives us the capacity to awaken consciousness is that yod, the dot. But that yod not only is sexual energy, it is the consciousness, it's our essence. There are people who are born into the physical world who do not have that. They are what we would call, in other words, shells, klipoth, demons. These are people, physical people, who walk around and do things, but who have no conscience. No consciousness, no conscience, no sense of right and wrong. They're there just to act as vehicles of karma. They are demons in physical bodies. And these are people that we see on the news all the time that walk in our streets and work with us and talk with us and play games and tease and and make movies and television and do many things. And we worship them as celebrities and as great writers and great authors and musicians and this and that. And they look like everyone else, but they have no conscience. They don't know that they are this, right? But the fact is, those are what we call lost because they have already abandoned their own inner God and chose crime instead. So the danger is there for us to become that because the more we persist in producing actions that are harmful, the more we encase our own consciousness in ego, in karma, in lust and anger and pride. And when that, e- when that consciousness is completely encaged in crime, in the psyche, our own inner being says, I can't do anything now. There's no seed that I can use to grow a good tree. And this is why Christ says he will chop down those trees and burn them. And that burning is in klipoth where the chaff, right, the shell that comes off the wheat is taken away and burned. Inside of that seed, the wheat, there is the kernel of consciousness, right? But that soul can no longer redeem themselves. They're not, they don't want it. They're so trapped and enmeshed that out of compassion, God instituted the abyss. And those seeds are cycled down through those levels of hell in order to purify purify away all of that impurity. And then after a few thousand years of suffering, they can try again. Yes? So, um, the third people are uh, lost. There's no way while they have a physical body they can somehow fight it. I know it's going to hit, but they can fight it. It's going to be a very uh, difficult struggle. There's always the door of redemption. There's always the door of repentance. It is always there. And that's why we see angels working in the, even the lowest levels of hell, trying to save people. That's always there, but it's highly unlikely. Because you have to keep in mind that karma is an energy that moves in a certain direction. And when you've instituted an enormous amount of force driving the consciousness in that direction, which is downwards into more materialism, it's highly unlikely for that to suddenly reverse course. It can happen, but it takes a lot of force to push it back the other way. So when we feel ourselves becoming heavier and denser and deeper and descending and getting worse and worse, we have to work twice as hard to return back to the light. Mm-hmm. You said uh, transmutation uh, and meditation, or transmutation has multiple purposes. Mm-hmm. And, and aspects, yeah. And aspects. Now, is, is it correct? Did you say that uh, one is the elimination of to, to know ourselves, first of all, uh, in order to eliminate the eyes? Well, what I was giving, there were three steps. Transmutation, meditation, and elimination. Okay. Transmutation having different aspects means there's different practices, either as a single person or in a couple. Right? And it does have different purposes both to rejuvenate the body, to create the soul, and also to destroy the ego. Yes? Could we actually do harm by presenting this knowledge, specifically the uh, key of transmutation, to people who perhaps aren't ready to receive this knowledge? Or are we at the times of the 
and so that we really need to just give it freely. Okay. The question is, can we harm someone by giving them this knowledge, or is this the time when we should give it freely? We've entered into the age of Aquarius, and this is the age of the water bringer, and that water is the knowledge embodied in Sarasvati, that divine mother, who's the goddess of knowledge, intelligence. This is the time when the knowledge has to be given freely. And this is why Samael and Vior wrote all of his books and gave all his teachings and lectures, is to give this knowledge freely and openly to humanity because they need it. It is a great mistake to hide this knowledge. The hiding of this knowledge belonged to the Piscean era, which ended. In the Piscean era, the fish hide in the waters. In the Aquarian area, the waters are poured forth with abundance. Now, knowing that, we have to also understand how to deliver the water. You don't want to choke someone on it. You have to deliver the water to the person where it will restore them and benefit them. Meaning we need to have skillful means of doing so. And this is something we have to gauge based on our own temperament, our own idiosyncrasy, but most especially on the capacity of the receiver. If the receiver has a very small cup, you cannot fit a gallon of water in it. You can only give them a spoonful or a cupful. And as a teacher or as a student of this teaching who wants to help others, you have to learn to gauge based on your intuition and your best judgment, how to approach each person. This is why Samael and Vior wrote a variety of books with a variety of levels of depth. Some of them are quite simple and appropriate for people who are prepared for that level. Some of them are extremely direct and intense because there are people who need that. In this Aquarian area, in general, we need to give the knowledge and not hide it. It needs to be made available because people are searching for it everywhere. Yeah, that's true. This is why in the gospel that I read, John the Baptist is giving the gospel of baptism in the wilderness. And he symbolizes the prophet, the initiate, the bodhisattva, who teaches how to transmute. And the wilderness is life. Malkut is this world. It's necessary for us to teach. It is necessary for all of the schools who belong to the Gnostic Church to make this knowledge publicly available. This is the purpose of Christ in this age. It is not to hide the knowledge anymore. It is to give it out so that as many souls as possible can enter into redemption. If we withhold the knowledge from people, we commit a crime. Any other question? And that's why I stated explicitly, baptism is the foundation stone of the Gnostic Church. Sexual transmutation. If a Gnostic Church or Gnostic school that calls themselves Gnostic is not publicly teaching transmutation, they are not Gnostic. Simple. Mm-hmm. Well, that's another problem. Yeah. I mean, when I say transmutation, I mean the entire practice. Those three phases. Transmutation, elimination, and uh, meditation. It's not sufficient just to withhold the sexual energy. We have to transmute it. And that transmutation only occurs as we kill the ego. It's alchemical. The putrefaction and death of the ego has to happen. Otherwise, the soul cannot be born. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are many. That's that would be the transmutation. There are breathing exercises, pranayamas. Uh, just the pranayamas, or is that just one breathing exercise? Well, as I said, there are many forms of transmutation. There are many ways to transmute sexual energy. For a single person, the most powerful is breathing exercise, like a pranayama. But we also have runic practices, Tibetan practices called yantra yoga. We also have uh, a single person who's 
withholding the sexual energy can transmute through many ways, even listening to classical music or making art. Because this is a creative process that utilizes creative energy and can transform it. Singing mantras is a transmutation practice. So there are many varieties. Pranayama is the most direct. This is where we harness the wind through conscious will and, and recycle it in the body. Any other question? These two names of my team might symbolize also the two waters in each monad of either man or woman, and they use the circle organ. Yeah, that would make sense. The point is made that the two mems of Mayim can represent the gonads of the male, the testicles, and the ovaries of the woman, where the yod is the sexual organ. Yeah. Thank you. We'll see you next week. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, I'm